listen only mode. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the 2018 New England Greenhouse webinars. My name is Jeffrey Jewell from the University of Massachusetts Extension. The webinar series is a collaborative effort of UMass Extension, University of Connecticut Extension, and University of New Hampshire Extension, and is sponsored by Sangro Horticulture and Blackmore Company. The theme for the webinar series is Growing Healthy Roots, and the title of the webinar today is Identification and Control of Root Pests, and our speaker is Daniel Guren, who is an entomologist with Cornell Extension. If you have any question during the webinar, please type it on the question box at the end of the webinar, then we'll answer the questions. And after the webinar, there will be a short survey. Please complete the survey before exiting the webinar. Before I pass the controls to Dan, I'd like to mention that the recordings of the webinars are posted on the UMass Extension Greenhouse and Floriculture Program website. And at this point, I'd like to pass the controls uh, to Dan to continue with the, with the webinar. Okay, great. Um, so, thanks, Jeffrey. And uh, so, uh, very good. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thanks, Jeffrey. And can you hear me okay? Yeah, good. Sounds okay, good. great. Great. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And uh, um, uh, this is an interesting topic. Um, I get questions fairly regularly about managing pest problems uh, in the root zone and or in uh, soil and potted plants. And uh, it's always a bit of a puzzle. We unfortunately don't have uh, an abundance of options. Um, for all the different problems that we we can see and there's relatively little information on management and control on how well these things actually work so um, I'll give you some notion of um, what information I have and some of the work that we have done to try to answer those questions but a lot remains to be done and there's definitely some needs for new products and, and new uh, new controls for some of these pests um, some of the things I will be talking about um, um, may not apply to your state, your region, your country. Uh, so be sure you read the labels um, and know what is legal or not legal for use in your state. Um, and some of the things that I'm going to be talking about are, are restricted or uh, may not even be allowed in the state of New York. Um, and uh, so there's a disclaimer on the first slide there. And in this this uh, slide is a um, uh, shows you a picture of a um, Narcissus bulb fly we won't be talking about, but that's one example of the below ground pests that we sometimes deal with. This is uh, primarily an outdoor pest problem. Oops, uh, back again here. These are some of the common pests that I have had questions over the years um, that are um, found in the root zone of plants, uh, root aphids. There's actually many, many species of aphids that will feed in the roots of plants. Uh, root mealybugs, I get questions about very rarely. Uh, once in a while, um, I've had a probably half a dozen questions about those over 30 years of, of working here um, with greenhouse and ornamental plant growers. Uh, fungus gnats are a very common problem. Uh, larvae are a particular pest in the root zone. Shore flies, um, occasional problems too. Uh, bulb mites, um, fairly uncommon, but when they pop up, they can be extremely frustrating. There are several different kinds, and we'll go over what those are. European pepper moth, um, I included in this group because it can feed on in on roots or within the root zone. Um, it's more of an above ground feeder, but um, it, because it's popping up and we're seeing more of it and I'm getting more complaints, I thought I would mention it today. Black vine weevil, um, there's other kinds of root weevils um, in other areas. Uh, black vine weevil has been the main one that we have seen, although in use, recent years it seems to have almost, all but disappeared. Uh, white grubs, we'll talk about those too. Oriental beetle is the number one problem we deal with on ornamental plants and outdoors. Um, it's also a turf grass pest in our region and it seems to be spreading in the Northeast and it's found in other areas, uh, Northern Ohio and elsewhere. Um, we won't talk too much about thrips. Uh, we think about Western flower thrips certainly as the above ground pest, but gladiolus thrips will overwinter in corms and storage and there are some other species. Um, I have had occasional problems with them. Uh, as well. Um, and I said Narcissus bulbfly, we won't really talk about that's an occasional pest. Uh, I get inquiries about in landscapes. 
there are some associations uh, between some of these pests and pathogens at all, uh, that I'm aware of. These are some of the ones reported in the literature. Um, uh, Pythium has been associated with fungus gnats, although some recent work out of Cornell found uh, no association or no direct association between Pythium, uh, several species, and fungus gnats uh, in geraniums. So there may be less of a threat there than um, we might otherwise be thinking. Um, with shore flies, there's several uh, fungal pathogens listed there. Um, my, patho my pathologist here tells me that uh, there's also some concern for them spreading bacteria as well. And for bald mite, we have Fusarium oxysperum has been associated with that. So let's talk about some of these in a little greater detail. Um, here's a list of the root aphids that I have most commonly encountered, at least most of them uh, are here, um, and some I think some of you may have seen as well. Cabbage, aph cabbage root aphid is one we've seen. It'll go to roots of brassicas. Um, in nursery, I've seen that on Iberus, which is a brassicaceous plant. Um, and lettuce root aphid, I've heard of problems in uh, hydroponic lettuce production. Um, woolly aphid procyphilis erigeronensis, uh, we've seen in lettuce and outdoor plants like goldenrod and other composite plants in nurseries. Moneywort aphid is probably the most common one I've actually been getting complaints about. The cabeus lysomachii, this is in Lysomachia numularia, um, and uh, we find it in the roots and, and in the leaves as well. Uh, poplar vagabond aphid I put in here, it's not one that I've actually encountered, but I added it because when we're getting questions about root aphids in Lysomachia, uh, loose strifes, um, this one always seems to pop up as a question whether it's there or not, but I actually haven't encountered that one yet. Tulip bulb aphid is one we've seen uh, certainly on uh, a number of occasions in iris, uh, tulips, uh, crocus, and some other crops too. Shallot aphid was one that came up fairly recently in um, uh, greenhouse chives. Um, we had a grower with that with some problems on foliage as well as in the root, root zone. Mint aphid was another one we saw in greenhouse production of mint plants and it goes after other things in the mint family as well. And rice root aphid we've seen in foliage plants, um, also some, in some other edible crops. It has a very wide host range um, that can include grasses and other species too. And you'll notice that in this list I've included uh, not only the crops of concern sort of towards the left, but also I'll mention things like populus, uh, populus nigra. Um, these are the primary hosts where they can overwinter. Um, and so you might have some concerns if you're trying to grow crops around these primary hosts that you'd have all you need to have the complete life cycle. Having said that though, all of these uh, secondary hosts that I've mentioned, the brassicas, uh, lettuce, uh, lysomachia, these aphids can uh, remain on these crops year round. They don't need the other primary hosts, but when you have the primary host, you can uh, have a situation for perhaps um, keeping the problem around um, permanently. So this, just to keep that in mind. When we're dealing with root aphids, this is the kind of thing that probably people first encounter. They might uh, take the plant out of the pot and they'll see these uh, waxy white, bright white areas. And then if you look more closely, you can see the little pale yellowish aphids there in among those waxy spots. We've actually had uh, growers get their, have their plants rejected because there were these root aphids. Um, they don't seem, didn't seem to be affecting the health of the plants, at least in those cases that I saw, but they were still rejected at the time of sale. Um, the wax also might uh, provide some protection for the aphids, uh, keeping the moisture or water away from them, um, which also might make uh, treatment a little more difficult if it's hard to get an insecticide down to where those aphids are because the wax is repelling it. This is the uh, moneywort aphid that we've seen on Lysomachia. You can see a lot of waxy material there on the root zone and in the upper right is a close-up of one of those, what those little aphids look like. And you can find these on the roots as well as different times of the year. You'll see some on the stems and the leaves too. And um, here's a, another shot on the upper right showing the aphids on one of the leaves. And if you look uh, just where that arrow is pointing, you can see a little bit of that waxy material right at the base of the stem. And over to the right of this, uh, I think maybe you can see my pointer, you can see a little bit of waxy material at the base of that stem as well. So if you're trying to monitor for this, uh, maybe the plant's a little bit too young to, to take out of the pots, the roots haven't reached the outside of the pots yet, you might be able to detect them by looking for a little bit of that waxy material at the base of the stems like this here. 
Um, I mentioned that these aphids have primary woody plant hosts in some cases, in many cases, and this is just shows you one of the uh, um, one of the ones that does. This is the cabbage root aphid, which is sometimes called the poplar petiole gall aphid. And there's the stage that you'll see on different kinds of poplar trees, these galls that they make. And if you open up the galls, you'll see the aphids inside. And on the lower right is you'll see some of the, the same aphid species, but on the roots of cabbage. So they it's good to keep in mind the cases that you're dealing with if, in case they have these two different alternate hosts, um, what that might mean in, in terms of management implications. This is uh, the gall that lettuce root aphid makes. Uh, this is on Populus nigra, which uh, one variety is called Lombardi poplar. This is actually a fairly pretty common plant in some areas of the country. Um, so this is what you would see if you, were, uh, if you had lettuce root aphid on that tree. A few years ago, we had a real problem with this particular aphid. It's called crescent marked lily aphid. And I'm pretty sure these were brought in on the bulbs in that one case. Um, there was no other sources of the aphid in the greenhouse and it was very early in the spring. Um, you can see the dark markings on those aphids and it's in a mixed population with foxglove aphid too. Um, I think these are coming in with the bulbs uh, unbeknownst to anybody initially and then later on as the plants grew you could see the aphids at the base of the stems and then gradually moving up uh, further uh, populations built up pretty high. This one has also a very very wide host range uh, almost as wide as green peach aphid so there's some concern when you get this that you could have it spread around and become a real problem in other plants in the greenhouse. This is tulip bulb aphid. This was a case several years ago um, where a grower was forcing German iris uh, for early spring sales and saw really huge numbers of these aphids developing on the uh, foliage fans. This presents a particular difficulty because you've got vertical and fairly waxy foliage, which is very hard um, to treat successfully. It's hard to get materials to stick. So. Um, we had did a trial uh, looking at control of this. I'll show you in a moment. And the lower right, you'll see there's a crocus with some uh, tulip bulb aphids on it as well. And there's a close of what some of the aphids look like. Um, this is a trial we did looking at control of tulip bulb aphid. We had uh, made two applications. Uh, most were sprays, but we did also have one drench of uh, marathon that was only applied one time. And then we watched the population over about a two week period. And you can see uh, the different treatments we used and what the populations did uh, over, over time. And we had mixed Latron, which is a sticker, in with the, all of the spray treatments. Uh, and that seemed to be very necessary in order to get any kind of material to adhere to the foliage. Decathlon obviously worked quite well in this case, uh, wiped out pretty much all the aphids. MPED was pretty good. Um, and probably with an additional application or two, you would have seen that those numbers drop even further. Endeavor uh, did not work very well in this case. It was a bit of a surprise because Endeavor is usually a very, very effective material. Uh, Marathon also worked quite well. Um, the drench of Marathon, you can see the number is declining but still remained fairly high after about two weeks. Uh, it would have been interesting to extend the trial much longer because maybe we would have seen better control had we, uh, had we uh, waited longer to, for the material to be taken up in the foliage. So this is just one trial we did. We did not actually look to see what was going on on the root zone with the aphids, but I'm expecting there were some aphids down there as well. Um, it would have been interesting to see what happened to them following these different uh, treatments, particularly the drench. Root and mealybugs uh, are as a, um, a pest I get questions about very uncommonly, but I hear people talk about it as though it's very, very common around, but uh, there's some pictures of what some of them look like. There's a group of them that are called ground mealybugs. These are Rhizica species, um, and there's several others that can also be on roots of plants. We've even seen uh, what I believe are citrus mealybugs coming up from bulbs that were in a trial we had done here. And uh, I had never heard of uh, um, citrus mealybugs ever being on roots of plants or bulbs, but I, uh, I suspect that's where they were. That's the only place they could have come from in that particular case. Now, I don't know if this would apply to root mealybugs as much as some of the above ground ones, but we know that um, some mealybugs like citrus can certainly hang out on plant benches between crops for weeks at a time. And we had one grower that had a problem with uh, mealybugs just totally unable to control them. And um, we found that they were hanging out on the benches between the crops and so he bought a bench washer. And this is probably a little um, more than most people would need to go to, but if, you, uh, if you're dealing with mealybugs, just be aware they can hang out between crops in an important 
uh, procedure would be to sanitize or power wash or rinse the benches off between crops um, so that they don't linger and, uh, and move from one crop to another that way. A little bit on fungus gnats and shore flies here. Um, obviously, this is a, a fungus net up in the upper left and a shore fly in the lower right. And many of you are probably familiar with what these look like. There are a lot of small black insects you'll get on sticky cards if you're monitoring, uh, but just be sure you're able to distinguish one from the other. Fungus nets are more serious in my thinking because the larvae can actually cause direct damage feeding and chewing on roots and girdling plants. We've had problems with that. Uh, shore flies don't do that. The larvae don't feed on plants. Uh, well, they, they don't feed on older, pl uh, larger plants. They'll feed on, on algae uh, and possibly some organic matter too. But uh, shore flies can be a great annoyance when they build up in very high numbers in the springtime in greenhouses. So this is where shore flies like to live. And if you're dealing with uh, shore flies, which have larvae that can be in the root zone in plants, um, the, the way to deal with it is try to address the uh, algae that are the source of the problem where they're mostly feeding. Yeah, and there's different products that are labeled for use, um, whether they're on uh, plants and pots or on the ground like you see here. Um, there's other options you can use for shore flies if you, you want to go after the adults, uh, conserve or the organic version and trust does seem to knock them down very, very well. Fungus gnats, uh, the uh, larval stage that is, will chew on roots or girdle stems. You could see some damage to poinsettias on the upper left here, and on the lower right is a uh, geranium seedling that has been girdled. Uh, we've seen sometimes very large areas of geranium seedlings killed or severely damaged by, by fungus gnats. Um, and there's a picture of what one of the larvae look like uh, in, in the inset on the left there. And you notice it has a small black head. You won't see that with shore flies. Shore flies don't have that very dark head that you'll see there. This is just a close-up of some of the damage on the right. This is to a vinca seedling that has had the roots chewed off by the fungus gnat larvae, and so you may not necessarily see this above ground. The stem may not be girdled, but you'll get this kind of damage below, and the plants will just not be thriving or being doing very well as a result of that. This is another kind of damage we've seen from fungus gnat larvae. Uh, this is on a Heliopsis seedling. You can see the leaves that have been that were close to the surface have been chewed away here. Um, the plant, I'm sure, will do fine uh, if the larvae don't attack the stem or the roots, uh, but uh, it, it makes these plants um, not desirable for sale, and it may affect survival if it's really, really severe and goes after many, many leaves. I just want to share with you some results of trials that we have done. These are all replicated studies, uh, I'm not showing the statistics on any of them, but to give you an idea of how they, how they turned out. So here we had tried drenching uh, pots with fungus gnat infestations that we induced. Uh, we had placed larvae in these pots and um, we had compared all of these insect growth regulators, NSTAR, Hazeton, Adept, Citation, and Distance. And this will show you the numbers of fungus nets that emerged from pots that had been treated. And you'll see the Azotin, Adept, and Citation Distance were the most effective in, in this particular trial. Azotin is a uh, botanical or biopesticide, um, one that organic growers can use. The others are more conventional, but they're all these are all growth regulators and, uh, and, uh, and uh, can be used for, fung for fungus gnat larvae. This trial, we had looked at other treatments, uh, uh, beneficial nematodes, uh, natural, which is a BT product, Duragard, uh, uh, older organophosphate insecticide, and conserve. We used a very, very high rate of conserve. I was curious to see how well that would work um, because it has some efficacy against uh, flies in general, and it's used in fly baits. Um, but this is a really, really high rate, and it's, uh, as I said, not labeled for this particular purpose. Uh, but uh, you can see the results from this trial. The nematodes and the conserve were giving us some pretty good moderate suppression, not great, but some, some control. I think whenever you're using nematodes or even natural, you'll need to use repeat applications. Uh, one application is usually not going to do it, but I know of growers that are using nematodes regularly and they feel they're getting very good results for control of fungus gnats. This trial, we had looked uh, at some other treatments in geraniums, the you know, nicotinoids marathon and flagship at two different rates and compared that to distance the insect growth regular at the six ounce rate. And we got very good control with all of these treatments. So it's, uh, it's good to see that there, there's a, a number of very good options that you can use for controlling fungus gnats. And here's a summary of what the options that are available to you. Um, these are in our Cornell guidelines and your state guidelines will probably have some of these as well. But here's the ones that um, I'm aware of that we can use that you, uh, for these different, different pest problems.
Let's talk a little bit about mites on bulbs. There's three main kinds of below ground mites that I've ever had questions on. Uh, bulb mite, there's a couple of species that are listed there. We've seen those on tulips, on um, uh, Easter lilies, certainly uh, crocus, and uh, occasionally other crops too. But those are the ones where I've seen it most commonly, and they can be pretty damaging. There's one called dry bulb mite. There is some confusion um, with wheat curl mite. Uh, they're very, very similar morphologically. Uh, this is an areophyid mite um, that has been recently popping up on garlic. Um, I have not actually seen this myself on um, any uh, ornamental bulb crop like tulip specifically is what it goes after, um, but it has been seen in the region on garlic and it's known to attack onion leek and other alliums and, and ornamental alliums could probably be lumped in with that as well. Bulb scale mite is something I heard of a couple of years ago uh, because it was causing problems, particularly in um, amaryllis uh, production in Europe. I have not seen that stateside or ever encountered it, but I just include it there just to uh, remind you that there's other ones around besides just the uh, other bulb mites we've heard about. This is a case of bulb mite um, injury that uh, was brought to me a couple of years ago. The plants looked pretty bad. Uh, they uh, were yellowed and stunted. They were not just obviously not healthy. And when we looked at them, the uh, bulb itself was rotting and the interior was uh, also had these little chambers that had uh, many, many mites in them as well. And there's a close-up of what the bulb mite looks like. That's a rhizoglyphus. I've also had complaints about bulb mite problems in uh, bulbs on um, retail displays. Um, so some samples were brought to me and these were tulips that had an infestation of bulb mite, but on the display itself, there was another mite that was crawling all over. This is what actually um, was brought to their attention, that there were huge numbers of these mites crawling over the display. This is actually not bulb mite. This is Tyrophagus putrescentii. This is one of the mites that is sold in with um, predator mite um, sachets that uh, help keep the predators alive. It's a food mite. And, uh, and so they, but they can be pretty annoying when they build up in pretty high numbers. They feed on organic matter decaying material. Um, they are an occasional plant pest, not a very serious one, um, but in high numbers, I've actually seen them cause a small amount of plant damage. But this is uh, more of a, 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 a mite that feeds on decaying material than live plants. This is a uh, dry bulb mite on the upper left. You can see in the yellow image there, there's some very tiny little elongated mites. Uh, it's a, uh, I think a 32X close-up of, of what those mites look like. And below that, you'll see some garlic cloves that have been damaged and sort of bronzed as a result of this. On the upper right is what they'll look like later on after they've been kept in storage. And you don't see much in the way of external symptoms, but you can see in the, on the uh, garlic on the lower right, there's some depressions where the cloves are obviously um, collapsed or not doing well, and that's uh, due to dry bulb mite as well. These are some treatments listed for bulb mites that I am aware of. We really lack good, effective alternatives. There have been some, there's been some research looking at some of the many miticides that we have, and some have been found to be fairly effective as uh, as drenches or soaks, uh, soaking the bulbs in the uh, in the uh, solution. But those are not registered uses at the moment, and that does present the problem of what do you do with the material when you're done with it, when the when the uh, uh, liquid is when you're finished with that. So this is a list of the options that I'm aware of. Um, there's heat treatment, uh, soak of about 110 degrees for about an hour. I would be cautious about using any kind of heat treatment on a flowering bulb unless you knew for sure there was not going to be any injury. Um, there is a heat treatment recommended for garlic that can is known or is known to decrease germination. Uh, you can steam the soil if you're planting into soil that is known to have a bulb mite infestation and uh, treating it at a high temperature will kill or control the majority of bulb mites that way. Duraguard is the only insecticide I know or miticide I know that it has a possibility of use for bulb mite, and there's some research done many, many years ago that found chlorpyrifos could be effective. Part of the problem is if you have a bulb already in a pot that's got an infestation like you saw with the Easter lily, you're not going to control the mites inside the plant with that Duraguard. This is going to be more of a preventive type use. Um, and because it's kind of hard to get the material from the top of the media surface down to the 
to the basal plate of the bulb where the mites typically hang out. I've suggested that if people want to use this, they may partially fill the pots, treat the media uh, surface, plant the bulbs, and then fill with the media on top of that so that the drench is located near the base of the uh, bulb uh, at planting, and that might be the best way to handle that. A little bit on black uh, vine weevil. A couple last things to mention here. This is a problem we haven't really seen much of lately, but we used to have a problem, particularly on perennials. Um, we used a product called MET52. It's a metarhizium fungus, uh, really effective, as you can see here, very high levels of mortality when the granular product was mixed in with the media, uh, somewhat less control with the other conventional treatments. And we had done that also as a drench, looking at three rates of the MET52 compared to uh, Safari and Marathon, and also very high levels of control. So this uh, is a very, very effective uh, biocontrol for black vine weevil. Um, we don't see the problem anymore, so it's not as much needed, but if it does appear again, it'll be nice to know we've got a, we've got a product that does work. Beneficial nematodes can be used as well. Um, there's been um, mixed results, I would say, with that. We've had not very good results, but I can say others have had better results, particularly when plants were growing in smaller pots, probably because the nematodes are better able to get to the larvae. A little bit on oriental beetle. Um, oriental beetle is a growing problem um, and around the region, at least in the northeast, as it seems to spread. You can see the grubs feeding at the bottom of the pots there. Uh, they will damage roots. The azalea plant on the right is heavily damaged, and there's a lot of beetles uh, shown in the background. There's a product called Oriental Beetle MD. It's for mating disruption. This is the pheromone given off by females to lure males, and if you put enough of these out into the a nursery area, you can disrupt mating and get control, and we found that that does work very well over time. It's a picture showing what oriental beetle on the left looks like compared to Japanese beetle. There's some confusion. The name sounds similar. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about a trial we did with oriental beetle. Um, and you can see grubs in a pot here. We're using this product called uh, Beetle Gone, and there's a granular version called Grub Gone. And we're using it as an off-label use uh, just to see if we can get control for oriental beetle. And we had drenched pots with the Beetle Gone, and we had tried the granular too. Um, what you'll see is that the drench on the left of the two different rates of beetle gone were pretty to very effective in controlling oriental beetle and the granulars were much much less so but there's a very very low rate of that um, um, so I don't know if the the uh, liquid will be available as a drench or labeled as such but we did get very very good results in this particular case so it's nice to see that we have a, um, a bacillus thuringiensis alternative uh, for controlling oriental beetle um, for those that would like an organic type of product. And just to show you a little bit how they compare, on the right is an effective treatment, on the left is a treatment that was much less effective where the plants are much more stunted. Last thing on European pepper moth, this is a growing problem for us, and you can see what the moth looks like, a distinctive little V in the wing. Look for the crown damage that you'll see here, particularly on succulent plants. On poinsettia, we've seen that here. Um, and uh, there's some damage to begonia as well. You can see the webbing and the damage to the leaves. You can monitor with a pheromone trap. They work quite well to detect the males, and you can see some damage, uh, some of the, the larvae and webbing in the pots when you, when you uh, take them out of the pots that should be visible. And if you look carefully, you might find the cocoons or the caterpillars that are shown in this particular picture. There's some damage to the base of a chrysanthemum, and one of the uh, pupae is shown on the upper left as well. Be careful not to confuse this with celery leaf tire, which causes fairly similar injury. Sorry, the picture's a little blurry there, but you can see some damage from celery leaf tire on the chrysanthemum as well. And the control options are listed here. Um, conserve, the pyrethroids, Tristar, uh, et cetera. Those are all the ones that are labeled or would be available based upon the labeling. Um, others that may give you incidental control, they're not actually labeled, but they have worked uh, in other trials are listed uh, um, below there, Adepta, Regard, et cetera. Just a final summary of some of the insecticides for root zone pests. Um, there's a list here of the neonicotinoids and of uh, imidacloprid flagship Safari and Tristar and what they're labeled for where you can use them. Some of the others, Asaphate, Orthene, Duragard, and Contos are listed here. One question I have is whether Contos, which has a high level of systemicity from a spray, whether that could be used to control uh, pests in the root, root zone um, and you wouldn't necessarily have to use a drench. We don't know that. That would be good to find out. There's a few others. Some of the growth regulators I talked about earlier, Citation, Adept, NSTAR, and Distance, or the other uh, product called Fulcrum, and some others that are listed there as well. 
And we have some biological and other materials here, um, some biocontrols, Delosia coriaria, nematodes, a couple of predator mites, um, Stratioleleps, Geoleleps, Macrochiles. Um, I don't know whether the aculeifer or the robustulus are available in the US, um, but um, if they are, those were ones we could also use. And then some others that I have mentioned uh, are listed below there as well. So I think I will uh, end there and see if anybody has any questions, um, any comments or questions anybody has. Hi, everybody. This is Ryan Dixon from the University of New Hampshire. Um, thank you, Dan, very much. That was an excellent presentation. Um, looking at, at the questions, so we don't have any questions in yet. Um, if you do have a question, um, if you'd please type it into uh, the text box and we'll read that out and, and Dan will answer. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for coming in and tuning in today, and um, um, thanks very much for, for um, joining our presentation. Thank you, Dan. All right. Very thank good. You. Thank thanks you, Dan. Lot. So I just want to mention that for everybody that uh, the recording of the webinar will be ho posted on the UMass Extension Greenhouse and Photoculture uh, website and the URL is uh, at the bottom of that slide there. And we have one more webinar to go next week. So if you have not registered for that, go ahead and register. And before you exit, remember to um, uh, uh, complete that short survey that is there. So otherwise, thank you very much all for signing in. I uh, hope to see you next week. Thank you, have a good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.